Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Only Stupid Answers. This is the show where you answer your questions about movies, TV shows, comic books, ghosts, and busting, and whether we do we still feel good about it. Those are the we, these are the questions we're answering. I'm DJ Wildridge, and with me, as always, is the enigmatic Roxy Stryer. Whoa, you were ready for that one today, DJ. It just popped in my brain. I don't even know if it fits, but it popped in there, and so I went with it. Yeah, how much busting of ghosts are we really talking about today? Uh, not nearly <laughs> enough, if I can be honest with you. <laughs> whoa, baby, whoa, uh, we will get there. We, we get there. oh my God, we sure will. Uh, but first, for those that uh, don't know, I explained at the top, we we're, we talk about pop culture stuff, and we're going to be talking about Ghostbusters Afterlife, the latest attempt to reboot the Ghostbusters franchise. Um and this one's for the fans, and by the fans I mean the boys. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, th- as always, if you want to listen to these episodes early, if you want, if you want uh, extra long episodes, or if you want the new Patreon show Spider Versity, you can do that over at Patreon.com/slash/OnlyStupidAnswers. Speaking of, every week we ask you a question, and last week um, I was out of town, and so the episode we put up was actually the first episode of our Spider Versity show that that I do with. Um, Sal from Comic Pop, where we go through, um, we're going through all the live action Spider-Man movies leading up to uh, Spider-Man No Way Home. Um, And so the question last week is, what is your favorite moment from the first Spider-Man movie? And uh, we can ask these questions on Spotify where you can answer them. Um, So keep an eye out. Uh, Xavier Thomas said, the best part is MJ. I feel that relationship really is the heart of that specific Spider-Man story. Also, DJ, I love Hellbent. Not many comics dot, dot, dot surprise you in the first two pages like you did. Uh, with a horse emoji, congrats. And if you uh, have read the comic, you know what he's referring to, and you're welcome. Um, I, w- I feel bad because I was just going to say that it's funny that his favorite moment is a whole character. Like a whole just the whole <laughs> aspect of the of the movie is is that is Mary. But now Jane. I can't make fun of this person because then they show mad support and love. So you all good in the hood still. Which by the way, which by the way, uh, for uh, keep an eye out in your email. The emails all hellbent has been shipped out at this point. Um, I believe looking through it, everybody in the states should have gotten their copy. Obviously, international people. It's taken a little bit longer, (laughs) but you should have tracking numbers in your email. And if there's any issues, feel free to message me through Kickstarter or tweet me or whatever. Also, a bunch of you have been sending pictures of the copies you get, and that's great for a variety of reasons. One, I get to see you celebrating your comic, and two, I know it got there safe. So so feel free to do that as well. Um, Elaine Balthazar says, Go Web Go is their favorite scene from the movie, the entire scene of Peter discovering his powers for the first time, that wall crawling scene, iconic. And Chris says, got to be the part during the board meeting where Norman goes through the five stages of grief in the span of like five seconds. It just shows how good of an actor Willem Dafoe is, which I agree. Roxy, off the top of your head, do you have like a favorite moment from the first Spider-Man movie? No, I'm just thinking about how long it's been since I've watched that first Spider-Man movie. Um, so no, I think my answer would be similar to like whole ass characters. Yes. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I can think of favorite moments from Spider-Man movies mm-hmm. in general, but you know, I don't know that people trust my taste after my love for Amazing Spider-Man too. So I don't even know if you all would want to hear some of them. <laughs> Listen, I will say this, and of course, I've I've only seen each of those Amazing Spider-Man films at the one time. Uh, Amazing Spider-Man two. Is better than Amazing Spider-Man One. That, that, <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I will, no, I re I rewatched it recently and was like, this holds up. <laughs> this is fantastic. fantastic. Uh, and, uh, yeah. So, uh, but Roxy, this is a good opportunity for you to rewatch the movies and then listen to me, Sal, me and Sal talk about them. <laughs> that is a, that is a good opportunity, and I like him a lot. When he came on, I was like, oh, this is a good. A good moist little ear boy. <laughs> he, he he is a moist little ear boy. Mm-hmm. So as I talked about at the top of the episode, um, the we're going to be talking about Ghostbusters. But before we do that, because I was out of town last week, Roxy and I did not get an opportunity to talk about the uh, Disney Plus Day event, which seems like it didn't go smoothly. Uh, it didn't it didn't go like maybe Disney wanted it to go. But again, I wasn't exactly like dialed in at the time. <laughs> I think my expectations for this were way too high. Were were you expecting like a fandom type thing? I think I was. 
I don't know that I was expecting it to be fandom in the sense that it was going to be four hours of nonstop trailer talking. But I do think that I was expecting like a good amount of trailer trailers, not just teasers, yeah. like some new announcements that I'm not, that I wasn't expecting. I mean, we did get things that I really like outside of Marvel star Wars verse, like proud family was one of my favorite TV shows growing up. So like announcements like that, that got me legit stoked, but are kind of getting buried because that's not the typical nerd dumb. So yeah. that's not the thing people are talking about. But I was really, I don't know, like, I, I was expecting this to be like when Hillary Duff came out on stage and said she was doing Lizzie McGuire again, which is not what this event was. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why I thought that that would be what we got. But because of that, I was incredibly underwhelmed. I didn't know. I don't think I knew about this until like the day off. Like, I didn't like, it's like, this is happening. And here's these trailers. I'm like, what is going on like what what was the plan here because i i felt like there was even more hype around what was that like the investor day thing like yeah, last yeah, year yeah. Mm -hmm. and i felt like that was handled better and that was an investor day it feels like something we shouldn't have even been in the room for <laughs> yeah the, the bigger problem can i call spade a spade for a second yes okay? the bigger problem for me was that this was the day that britney spears was finally freed and her two conservatorships ended and so i didn't care about anything else on the planet this day. So, so i like th that this was like okay so these shows are coming out uh britney spears is free like you know how much i care about this. well for you for those that don't know usually on our after show the the bonus extra long episodes we do we've been talking about free britney um and uh for those listening at home this is the first time roxy and i have really had a chance to like connect back up in a couple weeks so i'm gonna ask her about it Wait, are we the, is, are, is yes, are things so good <laughs> So both her personal her personal conservatorship and her financial conservatorship have both been terminated. Yes. So she is officially a free woman that happened in court on the same day as Disney Plus Day. Bummer for Disney Plus Day. Now there are things that take place since that are going to have to take place since. For uh, example, both Jamie and Lynn, her mom and dad, <laughs> and the court appointed attorney are all coming after Brittany for money for their attorneys because. It still technically was under the conservatorship and the estate at the time. So she's still like there, there still is that battle. And also the Free Britney movement is trying to get the DA to actually now sue um, not not only the court appointed attorney, but also Britney's dad because of how fucked up the entire situation was. Yeah. So there might be more things to come. Britney hasn't spoken on any of those. Britney's just said, I'm free. Thank you so much thank you so much uh, i need a little like time so yeah so that sounds amazing uh, yeah what do you think the half-life is for me feeling sad about this like what are the how long do i have to be excited about this before something could they, does it is, or is that just me does it feel like no no too very easy? short amount of time no it's a very short amount of time i mean it's not too easy because it's 13 years true so it's like but it is easy it is too easy in the sense that it's like there's another shoe that's going to drop at some point here. There's no way that there's not going to be another lawsuit at some point or something goes wrong with Britney. I don't put that out in the universe because I wish that. You know that I am the, a diehard Britney stan. But somebody who has not had to make decisions for herself or not been able to make decisions for herself for 13 years, the chances that that person makes all of the right choices moving forward, um, small yeah small so but her choices to make that's yes. the whole fucking point 100 so i think that we i think that this will not be the last we hear of this and if she does step in it and make a poor choice whether or not things revert uh or custody is tried to get taken or conservatorship is tried to what any of those things we will see but as of now the fact that she even like is allowed to take out her iud um, you know, she made that point that she said she was doing that so she could get pregnant because she wants to do that. These are things that like, holy shit, that's huge. That's huge yeah. that she's allowed to have uh, ownership over her own body again. So yeah. big, big win. Uh, big, big win for Britney, not a win for Disney Plus. Day. <laughs> well, I, I was just going to say good for Disney Plus for making that happen. I, you know what yeah, I mean? They're yeah. like, boom, that's our, listen, that's our priority. Um, back to Disney Plus Day. Um, so there are obviously, like you mentioned, there's the proud family. There's, there was a ton of announcements and I'm not going to go through all of them because I don't, it, well, I'll just focus on the stuff that we normally focus on on the show. Yeah. Um, nerd, nerd stuff. Mm. Um, so, uh, let's get through some of these teasers that we got. And I'm going to start with the one that I was, uh, most excited for, and then kind of the most confused by, which was the, the moon Knight teaser. And it mostly came from the, 
a very unusual choice of the, a very strained British accent that it appears Oscar Isaac is putting on uh, for this trailer. And I think conceptually, I get what we're going, what's going on here uh, in the comics. Uh, Moon Knight has multiple personalities. Um, and so I think what we're doing here is this is not necessarily the Mark, this is not necessarily Mark Spector's voice. This isn't necessarily Oscar Isaac's voice for most of it, but one of the personalities has this very strange British accent and they're using that as a contrast for what is the Moon Knight voice or the Khonshu voice, which is the Egyptian God that gives him powers. Uh, Moon Knight's origins complicated. And that's what we're doing. We're creating that contrast, but it was, it was baffling. It was like, why this is the first thing way who okayed this. <laughs> Yeah, so DJ, a lot of the internet was talking about this, and the question that I had, that I'm sure you had, is why was this the choice of what they wanted to show us? Like, for Moon Knight, why was why was that the decision that was made? Not the decision in the show, but the decision for the teaser that they specifically yeah. are showing us. Do you think it was, like, to get us prepared so that there wouldn't be backlash when you saw it? Or what do you think actually was the... I mean, that makes sense. It reminded me a lot. It rem it reminded me a lot of like Remy Malik from the Bohemian Rhapsody movie. The yeah, <laughs> like yeah. It just felt like a, it's just like oh, that's a real actorly choice. Like that's a real like uh, wanting to make an impression. I don't know the idea of maybe I, I I feel like the answer is they had to think it was cool, right? Everybody, because I think. If you're there and you're filming and that accent happens and you're not on set being like, yeah, that's what we want. You're like, hey, man, let's uh, let's not do that. Let's let's yeah, let's change sure. that. Sure. I, I don't know. I also if this was very the way this was shot was very dark. Yes. I don't mean I don't mean dark as in like mood wise. I mean, dark as in like when I had a hard time seeing in Game of Thrones. Yes. Uh, and I would be like, what's happening in the battle? And screaming at my uh, my television like i was an old woman mm -hmm. I, was like, I can't see it um so i i do get a little nervous with the way that 2021 shows are shot sometimes especially when we're trying to show that something is dark in tone that we show that it's dark in frame yeah and i'm like uh um also the way that this is shot is very much so kind of like a horror uh which is interesting. We yeah. get, um, I don't remember when this happened. There was the announcement that Gail Garcia Bernal is playing. I, I, I don't know if it's confirmed, but it's basically he's playing Werewolf by Night in a Halloween special they're doing. Of course, we're getting Blade. Um, we Since our last episode talking about Internals, we had confirmation that apparently that was Mahershala Ali at the end of Eternals. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm wondering if they're kind of, Moon Knight first appeared in the werewolf by night comic as like a one-off villain. And then he became popular and got his own comic. So I'm wondering if we're kind of positioning him more in a, a horror, a horror uh, aspect. I, I will, I just, I will say Moon Knight is one of my favorite Marvel characters. I know. And this, and Oscar Isaac is, is an actor I really like. Uh, and this trailer made me very nervous for the show. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like you were so stoked on this. The the fact that you kept telling me like Moon Knight, Moon Knight, Moon Knight, and then also correct me if I'm wrong, but is is Moon Knight Jewish? The he yes, he is very he he's very supposed to be. He's the son of a rabbi, yeah, right? <laughs> so that um, when I think you told me that, I was like, didn't know that much about Moon Knight, and since I've looked it further into it, I was like more excited about this show. And then I saw this, and I was like, from what I had heard about Moon Knight from you and from looking into Moon Knight, this trailer didn't match what I thought it was going to be. Mm. Doesn't mean that's a bad thing, but just it wasn't, I wasn't like, oh yeah, that that checks out. I was like, oh, that's, those are choices that are being made that are either going to really work or not. Yes. <laughs> you, that, yeah, there's one way or the other. Yeah. We'll see. Uh, I I will kind of say that was the, that was my general, It it's funny how like excited I was for shows like Moon Knight and She-Hulk and Miss Marvel. And then I saw the trailers and I'm like, okay. <laughs> well, can we talk about the She-Hulk trailer? Let's talk about the She-Hulk trailer. Trailer is not the right word. Teaser. Very, yes. Very this is, this is a teaser in the truest sense. Yes. How did you feel about this She-Hulk teaser? Well, I immediately got excited the second I saw Tatiana Mazzani because I like her a lot as an actress. Um, uh, and I do hope since she played multiple characters in Orphan Black, it's like I hope Oscar Isaac uh, sat down with her since they're now both in the Marvel family. Like, you're playing multiple personalities. Talk to Tatiana Mazzani. She knows how to do it. <laughs> She's yeah, got that yeah. dialed in. Um, and I, I, you know what? It left me with like no impression. Like, I was like, okay, it's... 
a She-Hulk show. I don't know. She says she's a lawyer. There's that weird scene where she like talks to camera, which is something She-Hulk breaks the fourth wall, but it doesn't look like it's Deadpool fourth wall breaking. It looks like they're shooting like a TV ad. Like I don't, I didn't know what to feel about it. How did you think she looked? I, with a brief hint of uh, She-Hulk. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It didn't, it looked like TV CGI. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm I'm still really excited for the show, but part of me is starting to wonder with all of these little teasers and all these shows coming out, are they pumping content out too fast and yes. are they going to slip? Are they going to slip up? Yes, because that is a good question to have. Mostly because of the scripts, not even because of mm-hmm. the editing or the CG, but like mostly story wise, I'm like, okay. Um, they have their work cut out for them. Obviously, every room's a different writer's room, so it's not like you're like all trying to do one thing at once. But with all these teasers, and it was like, let's show you what we, we have to for this day, get all the teasers in. And I was just like, some of these added no value. And I almost wonder if it was worse off for showing. Them. Agreed. Which sounds very negative, and I don't mean it that way because every one of these shows could still knock it out of the park. I didn't watch one of these thinking like, that 100% is going to suck. I know it. Yeah. I didn't feel that way, but I was just like, uh honestly i i watched it each several times and was like okay and i think also we're used to seeing a marvel trailer and having feelings about it and so the fact that it's kind of like well, all right. you know what i mean it's like i think it adds and because there's so many of these trailers came out once and we've got so much content i think that's a very valid question and like you pointed out <laughs> wow every writer's room a different writer's room it doesn't feel that way with Marvel because yeah. everything's connected. That there's this sense that it all has to eventually flow, flow through Kevin Feige and I assume a small team of other producers around him. And I think that I think that's a very valid concern. I think that that, that it, this yeah. might be too much. Uh, we also got Miss Marvel, which the one thing I'll give this Miss Marvel trailer is it does look like it's targeting a different audience than the other Marvel shows, which I think is smart. I think it's like if you're pumping out this much content. It shouldn't be for everybody. So this looks like it's more targeting the Mighty Ducks crowd as opposed to like the me's of the world, which I think is really cool. I know we haven't had a chance to talk about it based on like teaser images and stuff like that. It looks like they might be changing her powers a little bit in um, uh, the comics. It's She's stretchy powers. She basically has uh, Mr. Fantastic powers. And the fact that uh, they're making a Fantastic Four movie, it kind of makes sense that like, hey, let's switch it up, let's make her, it looks like her powers are more energy-based, she's still making in, elongated versions of her limbs, but with energy, and that's more in line with Captain Marvel's abilities. I That doesn't bother me, I feel like that all basically tracks. Um, and again, it's another opportunity to, as she even says in the trailer, uh, I, I believe the line is, brown girls from New Jersey don't aren't normally the ones that save the world. And it's like, yeah, that's why this matters. And so I, 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 that's the other thing is that we are, a lot of this is an effort to diversify the Marvel line. And so it's important that they do land it as opposed to right. like, you know what I mean? Like it means more. So hopefully it's good. Yeah. Um, and this teaser did in no way, and this one gave me no concern. Uh, so that was good. It was so short again though, but mm-hmm. it looked lighter. And uh, it kind of gave me some like Shazam vibes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I was like, this seems cute uh, and sweet. And yeah, I get what you're saying with Mighty Ducks audience too. I'm looking forward to the show. I was looking forward to the show. And even if maybe I'm not the target demo because maybe it does skew a little younger, I'm still for sure going to watch it. And I would be excited about that. But yeah, this one, this was not concerning in any way, which is good. Yeah, it's good. Uh, and now I know the shows you're most excited about are the animated ones. Uh, we've got a Marvel Zombies animated series that's spinning out of What If. So excited. Um, so Spider-Man excited. Freshman Year, which is apparently in the MCU and is leading up to, I presume, him getting drafted into Civil War, which uh, is great for me because it might be an opportunity to see the Spider-Man in the MCU actually get a chance to just uh, be Spider-Man and not yeah, have so to deal with... Not- <laughs> You said that this was the one you were most excited about. I saw on your Twitter. Yeah, I, well, funny. it's it's something I I want them to do. I feel like because every MCU Spider Man movie is so focused on who he's teaming up with or his relationship with Iron Man, one way or the other, uh, that he doesn't just get the chance to just be Spider. I just want to see Tom Holland Spider Man be Spider Man uh, and do Spider Man things. 
Um, and I don't think it'll be Tom Holland doing the voice. It wasn't Tom Holland doing the voice in in What If. Um, but I, I think there's an opportunity here, since this is pre him meeting Iron Man, to just let them tell a Spider-Man story in the MCU. Like that's all I want. That's all I want. It's just let him be Spider-Man. I don't want to. I don't want to hear him talking about like, oh, Tony Stark. I don't need it. I don't want it. We've got it. I'm good. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, and I just feel like the animation is the loophole they have to not have to deal with Sony. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like, so it's as cool as it would be, I would love a live action uh, Spider-Man show on Disney Plus starring Tom Holland. I don't think that's in the cards. Um, so I'll take what I can get. Um, everybody was expi- excited about uh, X-Men 97, uh, the return yes. of that. Um, and I didn't know how to break it to everybody that, I don't, I don't know if that shows as good as everybody remembers it being. <laughs> uh, maybe maybe make, this will be better than though, DJ. Uh, you know, maybe as well, we're going to talk about Ghost of Mr. Afterlife. I, I do think we're culturally doing ourselves a dis- disservice by focusing so hard on the past. Like we need to, we got a lot of, I know the future doesn't look great right now, but we let's uh, look forward a little bit anyway. Um, and then we also got Agatha House of Harkness. I'm I'm just really confused on why this show is the show that I I don't know because we didn't have enough shows, Roxy. We only have fifty live action Marvel shows coming out. We needed fifty one. <laughs> yeah, I said this when they announced the spinoff with with her. <sighs> I, I don't understand. I love Catherine Hahn like the next person. Yes. You know? Although I. I've been on a uh, tear recently about how Catherine Hahn played a rabbi in Transparent. Catherine Hahn, just in The Shrink Next Door, plays mm-hmm. a very Jewish woman. And Catherine Hahn was cast as Joan Rivers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Catherine Hahn is not Jewish. And I am like just on one about that these days. Mm-hmm. That's not Catherine Hahn's fault as much as it is Hollywood and casting's fault. But okay, so at least we have her in a, a non-Jewish role here where – Okay, that yes, that's my we don't know. We, maybe in the House of Harkness, we find out. <laughs> oh no! If, the, if all the witches become Jews too, I think that we've got a real witch hunt going on. Mm-hmm. So uh, th- that sorry, that's just a tangent that I had to get out there because as much as I love Catherine Hahn, that is like some weird choices that are being made. Yeah. Uh, again, not necessarily by her, but by her team or whatever. Uh, this is a role that I actually really like Catherine Hahn in. Yes, I thought she did a great job in this role. I think she's perfect for this role. Did I ever need to see this role in its own spinoff show? No. And I, I have no idea where this fits. What's this? When's the time period? Who are we? Who are the other characters? How are we? Where? Um, just all of those things. And I'm like, maybe this show ends up being bomb and I'm dead ass wrong. But like, what the fuck is this show? Yes. Good question. <laughs> and and I don't have any answers. I feel like this is their way of maybe trying to do uh, season two of WandaVision, knowing that they can't do a season two of WandaVision. Like, the, so is there no Wanda or Vision in this show, you think? I don't know. I don't know what they're doing with That'd with Wanda. Real. I mean, she's going to she's going to Doctor Strange, but it's like, yeah, but you gave her a show. Shouldn't she have a headlining thing now? Isn't hasn't she earned it at this point? <laughs> What I don't know what's going on with Wanda. I don't know what's going on with Vision. Yeah, very <laughs> true. Very true. So let's wrap up this Disney Plus talk. Did you get a chance to see this Obi Wan teaser? We got to see some concept art stuff like that. I know. I know you're you're a big Star Wars fan. What did you think of this? Well, more so as you know, I'm a big Hayden person. I'm obsessed mm-hmm. with Hayden Christensen. And um, while it's Ewan who's doing the majority of the speaking in this, yeah. the fact that he's so excited about the, the thing he's most excited about is working with Hayden again. And yeah. uh, as he says, it like swinging swords at each other, getting another mm-hmm. chance at that or whatever. Uh, I, how do you say it? Swinging. He said right. something. Taking another yeah. swing at each other. Or something another like swing. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wouldn't have called them swords. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, taking another swing at each other. A, I'm stoked on this. I think it's so, so effing hysterical that all of a sudden people have jumped on this Hayden bandwagon that yes. I have been a one man island on for my whole life. Uh, but fine, come over to the dark side, be with me. <laughs> I'm excited about that. I could not be more excited for the show. Did this teaser get me more excited than I already was? Maybe, maybe because I would feed into whatever they gave me right now. Uh, but we had already had that image released prior to this mm-hmm. of the 
two of them crossing streams. Yeah. So it wasn't like a big moment for me. You know what's interesting though is I do think the Marvel trailer should have been more like this with a little bit of, of the creative team. Like, hey, here's yeah. what we're doing. Like if I, if I have that teaser, but then you have Oscar Isaac be like, this is why I'm excited to be Moon Knight. And you're like, oh, you know what? I'm excited now. <laughs> Totally. They are the ones who can get us on board, especially like for some of the other people, I get why you wouldn't necessarily maybe have she, um, well, some of the less famous people, yeah. maybe they can't sell things as well yet. Cause we don't know them as well yet. Yeah. But like you just said, Oscar Isaac, like mm -hmm. that's somebody who can get me invested in something. Yes. So I, I think that whenever you have, you know, a name or even like Tatiana, people yeah. are so love her so much make make them you have them so use them use them gosh dang it all right that use is people the use people for once disney uh no uh that is our talk of the disney plus day uh flawless event everybody loves it no notes um we're gonna go to a quick ad break and then we will be back with ghostbusters afterlife and now we're back oh my goodness it's almost like for roxy and i no time passed and yet it's crazy it's crazy how that works crazy. So, Roxy, let's get into Ghostbusters Afterlife. Uh, the synopsis is when a single mom and her two kids arrive in a small town, they begin to discover their connection to the original Ghostbusters and the secret legacy their grandfather left behind. Now, Roxy, we the last show we did, we talked about Eternals. And I think by the by the time the episode dropped, Eternals had dropped down to, on Rotten Tomatoes, a 40-something percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Do you know, did you look, I have it in the doc. Did you look at Ghostbusters uh, uh, Afterlife's Rotten Tomato score? I did. It is a 72%. I saw. Which is fucking shocking. <laughs> it's, it's fucking shocking. Uh, the critic consensus is Ghostbusters Afterlife crosses the streams between franchise revival and exercise and nostalgia. And this time around, the busting mostly feels good. And, it, and it's like, what busting? Anyway, uh, it was directed by uh, Jason Reitman, who uh, did movies like Up in the Air, which I really enjoy, and Juno, and Thank You for Smoking. Uh, more importantly, he's the son of Ivan Reitman, the guy that directed the original Ghostbusters. And it was written by Gil Keenan and uh, Jason Reitman. And it has McKenna, McKenna Grace as Phoebe, Finn Wolfhard as Trevor, Kerry Coon, uh, Paul Rudd, Logan Kim, Celeste O'Connor, and Bokeem Woodbine, who is not the most wasted person in this movie, but he is wasted in this movie uh, as, as the sheriff, as Sheriff Domingo. Um, anyway, who, yeah. let's keep it. <sighs> Honestly, what we'll keep it spoiler. We'll keep, DJ, it, what do you do? It, we'll keep it spoiler free. But like, there, in front of our screening, there was a little thing with Jason Reitman, like, "Hey, no spoilers. By the time you get to the end, you'll know." And it's like, what do you mean? Anybody that's seen any of the marketing for this movie, if you've seen any marketing, and then after the first scene of the movie, you know everything the movie's going to do. Like, you you know what's coming. All right. Well, I just want to rewind for a second. Yes, DJ. please. <laughs> When you just said the the first thing that we saw, I don't know if this is going to be the first thing you guys see, but the first thing that, that the I, I refuse to call myself a critic, but the critic yes. screening saw was Jason Reitman saying that. The thing that he said that really was the note to me, though, that I was like, uh-oh, <laughs> was he said, he said, this is a movie about a fifth this is just a movie about a family made by a family and yes. boy oh boy was my dad watching over me every single step of the way yes he was breathing down my neck i could not make one move without my father seeing exactly what it was he like really harped on it yeah he spent a lot of time on it it was almost you were almost to expect him to be like literally he's off camera right, right now there. watching me it's to like make a joke or something but it wasn't a joke yes um and you know you can't really market yourself like how you dj you and i are both um uh aspiring filmmakers filmmakers yes. whatever you want to call us you can't call this a, a, fa a movie made by a family about a family. Like when you have millions of dollars, yeah. it's not a it's not a movie made by a family about a family. <laughs> yes. Also, uh oh, that your dad didn't trust any of the decisions you were making. Mm -hmm. That sounds like this movie is gonna struggle tonally uh, and all different ways. Let's give it a go. Yeah. So um, immediately, I was like, 
okay. Um, It was felt like an apology before the movie started. (laughs) It did. It did. So then we got into the movie and the first 10 minutes that take place, again, no spoilers, but the first 10 minutes that take place, DJ, I don't know about you, but before we see, maybe it's seven minutes, before we see Ghostbusters pop up, like the the sign, the words, I turned to the person I was sitting next to and uh, to Steph and I said, did, did you catch any, did any of that? Like, it was just a bunch of images. <laughs> like, yeah. Boom, 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 boom. And I was like, okay, uh, they're really going to throw us in there and not say nothing, but this seems to have a weird editing problem. But then the next hour was so ungodly slow. Yeah, I came out of this movie, it's like, wow, that movie was felt longer than Dune. It, it felt so long. <laughs> then we spend an hour, and I really don't think this is a spoiler, doing nothing that the title of the movie would state that we're doing. Yes. Uh, an hour on that. The good news about this movie is that the actors are very talented. Yeah, you ask me if you ask me uh, for a few of my favorite working actors right now. As you know, I am a diehard Carrie Coon fan. She's great. I am obsessed with her. I think she is. Not only do I think that she should have won for Leftovers and Fargo, but I think that she should be a household name. Like this girl is. This woman is a fucking incredible. But then, what is McKenna's name? McKenna, uh, 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 McKenna Grace. She played Phoebe. McKenna Grace. So I was like, why am I recognizing her so much? And Steph was like, oh, because you like that movie, The um, Gifted, with Chris um, Evans years ago. Yeah. And I was like, no, it's not from that, though. She was in Handmaid's Tale this past season. Oh, dang. And she is fucking phenomenal in the show. She is phenomenal in the show. And I was like... This little this little kid can uh, act. Yeah. Like, holy shit. This this girl can uh, act her face off. So uh, was it this season or what season was it in? Uh, all the Hamid's Tale things are, are running together. Yeah, but, she was also in, um, she played young Tanya and I, Tanya. Yes. Uh, I want to say yes. she also, yeah, she played young Carol in, in Captain Marvel. She was in the first season of Haunting of Hill House. Like basically, if you've seen something with a precocious little blonde girl in it in the past, you know, five years, it was probably McKenna Grace. <laughs> yeah, it was Esther Keys. That's the name of the character. And it was this season. She is so fucking heartbreaking. She looks completely different in the show. But she, like, watching her character on Handmaid's Tale, th- this actress is incredible. Yeah. So luckily, the actors were really good. All the actors, Paul Rutt, they cast really good people. Yeah. Oh no, can you see me? Yeah, I can see you, but you froze. I'm frozen. Oh, can you hear me? I can't hear you. Oh no. Hold on, DJ. I'm gonna hold on, DJ. I'm holding on. My camera overheated. Hopefully it just turns right back yep, on. You're good. You're okay. good. You're good. Okay. Uh I think McKenna Grace is everything. That's the whole point of that. That I think she is phenomenal. So the actors are good, but boy oh boy, could I not get enough snacks during this part? I, I yeah. would need stimulation. Well, and it's tough to you mentioned you mentioned the whole like the uh Jason talking about his dad, but the other concern thing is when you're like, man, this Ghostbusters movie is about family, and it's like that doesn't seem tonally in line with Ghostbusters. <laughs> At all, which it's not. I know a lot of people are like, why is it on a farm? Why is it in New York? And it's like, none of that really matters. Like, I, I think you should do it. It was weird the things they decided to keep and treat sacred and the things that they did away with. It was almost like every, all the artifacts, like every piece of junk a Ghostbuster has ever touched was was treated as if you were opening the Ark of the Covenant. Like it was treated like the holy fucking grail. Yeah. But all the tone, the characterization, the themes, and none of that it was kept. And it's like, that's wrong. That's like, like I'm on record of as as not being the biggest Last Jedi fan. But one of the instincts Ryan Johnson had that I think was really smart is when when um what's her face? Ray hands Luke the lightsaber and he's like, ah, fuck this. And he throws it away. It's like, yeah. That's because that stuff is stuff. It doesn't matter. That's not why you, you don't care about this. You might remember the stuff, the logo, the car, all that stuff's cool, but that's not why you loved it. You know what I mean? Why you loved it was, was the, the, and of course it's, you can create new characters, but the general ambiance tone there, if I were to describe Ghostbusters as as anything, like one word, it's irreverent. 
And that is, this movie does a complete 180 and is incredibly reverent to so many things. It, but it, it's also weird, like, I don't know who this movie, I've been trying to Roxy to figure out who this movie's for. I Be- think kids. Well, I'm not. So here's my I thought. Don't know, I, I we, it, It's a little slow for kids, but I think I think you might be right. I also think it, it might be for somebody who watched Ghostbusters when they were eight and then got in a horrific car accident and went into a coma and has been in a coma for however many years. And now they've woken up, but they're in their brain, they're still eight. And they and they kind of they remember the stuff in Ghostbusters. They don't remember much, but it, whatever. And then they see this and they're like, oh yeah. Ghostbusters because but it doesn't, it doesn't even, feel like Ghostbusters. But even they would be bummed to see it's not in New York. I mean, <laughs> it's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. It, bizarrely. And, and also I feel like DJ, there was something in the script that didn't make sense to me. And I was like, how did that get past somebody? For example, hope this is not, this is a minor, minor, not even a spoiler, but uh, a line. Yeah. At one point we find out that one of the characters is, um, 15 years old. Yes. Okay. Yes. But at another point we hear that he's failed his driver's test three times. Yes. You don't take a driver's test at that point. Mm -hmm. Like you you're 15. So that doesn't even make sense that then that would be, or like the way that we get to where we get to the way that we get to the house that we get to Yeah. all of those, those things that are taking place. I'm like, well, that doesn't make any sense or that wouldn't happen with a, with a kid. You can't just bring, can't just, put your kids in the you can't just go to a place with you don't know how's electricity like you just yeah. there's just so many things that take place in the first 10 minutes of the movie that i'm like this is asking us to suspend our disbelief in a way that i will i'm willing to do for there being ghosts but i'm not willing to do when you're trying to show me that this is the real world about mm-hmm. real families well and speaking of that a couple other things there, you're right with the suspension of disbelief one of them is they it, it, they everybody talks as if the Ghostbusters are like a myth or like bogus. It's like a, a giant marshmallow. Not only that. Let's uh, sorry. Not just the giant marshmallow person marched down Main Street in New York. The Statue of Liberty and Ghostbusters too. Like everybody should know there's fucking ghosts. Like why are we talking as if ghosts aren't real? And this they're talking about the 80s as if it's the 1680s. Yeah, as if it's a, a whole other century. But then we see that they have YouTube, so it's like. And they're able to bring it up. And also, uh, Paul Rudd is uh, a a summer school teacher, but also a seismologist. Right, right. And like, All I expected the- another shoe to drop there. Like, well, I'm not actually. No, I guess he's just a seismologist. It's like, what are you doing here? <laughs> The, the truth is, though, about all of these things, DJ, Yes. every single thing you just said, everything that I just pointed out, I would be OK with 100 percent of that stuff if this was fun. If it Agreed. was if it was fun, I would just be like, all right, he's a seismologist and a teacher. Yeah. All right. The kid was 15. He failed to drive. Step three. OK, all that. Like, I wouldn't give a, sh- a flying F because if it's, it's fun, it's fun. And then it's Ghostbusters. Yes. But it was it dragged yeah. so hard that it was like. The only moments of levity are when when McKenna's making her jokes, and I'm like, that was a cute little line. For yeah. one second, I'm smiling. But well, it was so draggy that I was like, bummer, this isn't fun, and it's not making sense. Yeah, and it just feels like, because you're right, it feels like for the most of the movie, it's less of a reboot of Ghostbusters and more of like, it reminded me a lot of like those Amblin knockoff movies in the 90s that were trying to like ape E.T. Um, and, yeah. then, and then I think... Is it even halfway through the movie we get our first ghost, or is it? I I think we're over an hour in. Yeah, so we're over. We get. I don't know though. Spoilers. He's been around. We get Muncher, who's literally our one ghost. That's literally that's it, right? That's the only new ghost we get is Muncher. And that ghost is Josh Gad, which. (laughs) And it's also like Slimer with a bit of a different gimmick, like. That's baffling to me. It's I you you and I probably had the same feeling of like once the movie's gearing up to it's like finale, it's like wait, that's it. Like that's all we don't get. Like and it's not like the first movie's like drowning and go. We get if uh, we get library ghost, we get Slimer, and then we get yeah. the montage at the end. And this movie even sets up another montage situation and then just shows one dude and then moves on. And you're like, what are we even doing here? What's going yeah. on? <laughs> Yeah, that was very, very underwhelming um, and made it less fun. Like, I feel like by definition, Ghostbusters 
you got to be <laughs> busting ghosts pretty fast. Yes. Um, and we're not. And then even when we are, uh, some of the visuals were cool on this, like yeah. some of the moments in the car. Uh, which We're is cool. is really cool. They've got they call it a gunner seat, but but yeah. this also goes to my other problem. They introduce new tech, but it's all pre. It, it it's in, it's interesting to me that the the son of the person that directed the original one made a movie where basically the the main characters are relatives of the uh, they're related to the previous Ghostbusters and just discover they don't need to do anything. They just get it handed to them by their relatives. Like, oh, here's this cool stuff. You don't need to uh, make your own stuff. You don't really even really need to figure it out. You're here's here's this gift from a previous generation. It's like, eh, that tracks for who's directing this movie. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. There's you mean there's some nepotism in the Ghostbusters going. On. Which which I I only bring up. Obviously, I have my problems with that, but yeah. it's it's just dramatically not interesting. Like it's just not, it, and it goes back to like the chosen one shit where it's like, well, yeah, you want to see them fuck up. You yeah. want to see them like really make mistakes or, and not know how to do it, or figure out how what they want to do. Figure out their own stuff. Figure out like that's where drama is. That's how you make movies. So just getting people getting handed stuff and told they're special. It's like, well, it's boring. Like I, I need them to figure it out for themselves. Yeah, yeah, that was tough. Um, but okay, the positive that I will give is that. By the time we get to the movie, end of the movie, I almost understand why this has a 70 something percent on Rotten Tomatoes because the last, I don't even want to say the third act because it's not the entire third it's act. It's literally but, like the end of the movie. <laughs> the end of the movie to me fucking rocked. Yeah. And I don't care whether, I don't care whether it rocked because uh, no matter what that would rock for me, mm -hmm. um, there was also some like, sentimental parts of it and you know i was so into the last seven minutes of the movie <laughs> that i almost forgot how much i really didn't enjoy the other four hours of the movie yes uh, and so i was like yeah and then you know then we have a mid-credit scene and a post-credit scene and and those didn't hit as hard for me but mm -hmm. those seven minutes man i was like i'm in it although one of the things about those seven minutes i'm still confused on and it's who's playing a certain thing that I'm like. Yeah, yeah, it's the way they did it. And it, it, I, I'm going to be honest, in some ways it made me feel a, a little icky. Like it felt like a little. Uh, I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about the uh, a woman. Oh, yeah. Well, you and I had like, both like, wait. And I've I've looked on IMDb. I was looking at the credits yeah. when the credits were rolling. I was like, if it is that cameo, they buried it. Deep. deep they they buried it deep it's and it's so also, buried i still don't know if that's what that was if that's what that was and also if it was why, why? why? like why because yeah. so again this is um no spoilers uh, although i think anybody that's seen any of the marketing of this movie will know what we're talking about i agree with you about the end in that at the very end suddenly it feels like ghostbusters like it's yeah. like oh this is what i've been waiting for for two hours what are you doing and, and so you and you'll know why the um, very, very light spoilers, I feel like, again, if you've seen the marketing, but if you don't want to know, skip ahead. Uh, the uh, the bad guy is the same bad guy from the first movie. And that made parts of this movie, when we're going through literally the exact same exposition from the first Ghostbusters, yeah. it's like, yeah, I know. Like, I know. And why are we doing this again? Like, I don't know why. They even did that in the 2016 version where they name drop Gozer and it's like, I, as a kid, like, Kozer doesn't mean anything to me. Like, if yeah. anything, the bad guy from Ghostbusters 2 made a bigger impression as, like, oh, the, the bad guy. Like, this is just a, the excuse for the Ghostbusters to hang out. I don't care about Gozer. Like, I don't give a shit. Do something new and different. I don't, you know what I mean? Anyway, real quick, before we go, let's answer some questions. That's what we do here. Yeah. We answer questions. Uh, we got Kevin here. On a scale of healthy night out to becoming a ghost the, uh, the next morning, how much nostalgia is in it if you made a drinking game out of this movie? Oh Well, Jason Reitman beforehand says, this is an Easter egg hunt for you guys who are the real fans. Ugh. And I, I don't feel like there was that much nostalgia. There was nostalgia in the way that it made me nostalgic for Stranger Things, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but like, no, it, it didn't have the same energy at all. No. Of, so well, that, in that way, no. Yeah, and there's a lot of the same stuff. Like again, like Spicy. all the gadgets are there. So if you're drinking everyone, you see one of those, you're going to be under the under the seat by the end of the movie. 
if you're waiting for like joke callbacks or like like you said any of the same energy it's like well oh, yeah. there's one dj do you remember the one oh my god oh <laughs> my god is it, mm, it mm, mm, mm. is it uh does it involve uh is that what we're talking 100%, about 100 percent. that's what i'm talking about fuck that i fucking hate I it i literally that. out loud go no. You know, I got to say, I got to say, it's incredible because here's, and Jake Hefner says, a most common critique I, uh, I've read about Afterlife is that it does the same thing Force Awakens did, which is the same story beats in a new rapper, uh, without meaning to sound like a, a dick. Is this laziness on the studio's part or a lack of faith in the IP itself? Should the studio have played it safe uh, like that or, or uh, should they have taken chances? And what, before we answer that question, I will say this, I got mad Force Awakens vibes from the, like literally down to like the way we reveal the Millennium Falcon and that to the way we reveal the car and this. It's like they're doing the same thing except it works better with Star Like that's what, Star Wars is a studio block. It was like the proto studio blockbuster, like doing that for like that and Jurassic world. However, I feel about those movies that works better for them. That's not what ghostbusters is. Like that's not what it's ever really been. I know we have mad nostalgia for it, but it's kind of like a shaggy dog comedy. Like it's not, yeah. it's not, it has the big stuff in it, but that's not in a way the 2016 movie had its problems, but it, that was more spiritually true to the movie than this one is. I feel like, but, um, and it just makes me think about like, man, Creed is the one that did this right. Out of all of these reboot sequels, Creed is like, Creed is just a good movie on its own. Yeah. <laughs> and I really like, like it also. I thought it did a very good job. Chapter one. Yeah. But also it is just a new movie. It's not like a, yeah. you know, yeah. like it's just, it's a, it's a remake of the other one. It's not like trying to. Yeah. Just I, thinking of things that didn't suck recently. Yeah. So anyway, but let's go back to the question is. Is this studio laziness that like, hey, we just want Ghostbusters, but Force Awakens? Do you think this was really Jason Reitman's what he wanted since he was a kid? Like, where where do you think this sprang from? I really think he answered that question with his. My dad was looking over my shoulder every step of the way. I think that's what this was. Yeah. But you know what, DJ? Not enough can be said about how much this has a good review on Rotten Tomatoes and how I felt like our screening really liked it. Yeah, like, there was a lot of laugh out loud. A lot of laughter. Like even afterwards, Christian Harloff was like, I can't wait to take my daughter to this. Like um, I felt like Scott um, was sitting near us. I yeah. haven't talked to him, but I felt like he was enjoying it. Uh, like there's a lot of people that I know and like, uh, I don't know how, uh, great drake felt but it seemed like she was laughing like there was a lot of like these big critics in this space that were really it seemed like and i haven't talked fully to all of them but it seemed like they were eating it up and i was like i this is when you and i are like who is this for i guess people <laughs> yeah uh, you know what you this might be a good this it's just it's just one of those like between this and eternals and, and again like i don't want people to get it it's not like a, i think eternals is like perfect or the best movie i've seen this year, people like, could think this movie is better than eternals i'm like flabbergasted exactly it's like what are we doing or, or i guess what like what's wrong with me where where am i where what's am wrong I, with where, me yeah, what am i missing um yeah i guess so and i guess it, it i guess it works i just uh again like I don't know. For, for me, the stuff matters. You want to capture the spirit and you want, and, and it's tough too, because I think this movie really showed me that like, it is tough to do a sequel to this because it really is those four guys in a lot of ways. Like yeah. it's, it's those four dudes. And so it's hard to, I'm of the opinion. I, I think this and the men in black franchise, I know that they're big money makers. We need to retire them as movies and just make TV series. I, I feel like they're, they are, perfectly suited to make live action TV series. Ghostbusters had an incredibly long running cartoon with a spinoff called extreme Ghostbusters that I still think is probably the best Ghostbusters sequel. Uh, and it's like, we j just make them shows. Like everything's going to streaming now, like fucking make a Ghostbusters Sony plus show. I don't know what, where Sony would shot a Netflix show. I don't know. I feel like this movie could have been excellent. I, there was the makings of a good movie. It was just a half an a full half hour too long. Yeah. I needed more focus on the adult characters. Yeah. Um, and I needed way more hunting of ghosts. Yes. I think like, and 
and another pass at the script. Yeah. Like, and, and I know that that's a lot of different things, but <laughs> I feel like this movie actually could have been good. Yeah, I I agree. I I totally agree. I think like diving into it, and I think this suffers from another problem of where we need to make everything a mystery. Like the movie treats McKenna Grace's the, who the grandfather is as a mystery, even though it's like clearly not. Like we, we already know. Why are you holding out on that reveal when we all know anybody that's seen the trailer know who knows who her grandfather is? That's yeah. not a reveal. You know what I mean? Like. Um, and, and I think that holding off is probably what keeps us from getting the go sooner. Like, just get to it. Just go, whatever. Last question from Leonard Kim. If there are ghostbusters, are there ghost savers, ghost preservers? If so, would you choose this path as opposed to being a ghost buster? Would you like try to defend the ghosts and keep them from being busted? Which then leads me to the question that I've always had with these franchises. Like what? is the deal with the go- are they yeah, yeah, are they totally. people or are they things I think I was only thinking about that during this movie though because I was not enjoying it so yes. I had a lot of moments where I was like you know there's a lot of time where we're like strangling a ghost in some way yeah. and I'm thinking to myself hey, also <laughs> and this was part of the marketing too we get all those little stay puff dudes why the, I, so I don't, I don't know what happened. There now. was a I, very I, specific reason in the movie, in the first movie, that the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man was a thing. That there's a very specific plot point. Did, I actually didn't understand that entire scene um, because, also, in the location that all of that happened at first started to happen. Yeah, is nobody else there? Is nobody else there? And also, the, the impression we're given is that this town is incredibly small like you could drive through it and not even know that you're in it and yet they have a very modern and well-kept walmart like a very modern almost empty as you pointed out walmart yeah like and like nobody else is like seeing it like what i that was a weird it was a weird moment there's a lot of weird moments where i was just like okay yeah (laughs) Yeah, so uh, I to answer the question, I think I would still be a Ghostbuster because they get the cool toys. Uh, <laughs> no, I think I would be a, a Ghost Saver until I knew that they were bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All the ghosts are pretty disruptive, except for one in this movie. But for the mo- for the most part, what Ghostbusters have shown up is that they're a real pain in the Over ass. Over the years, yes. I'm talking about specifically from this movie. I'm guessing yeah. this question is based on this movie. Yes. I would feel uncomfortable busting them. Do you want a sequel to this movie? Is it the last seven minutes of the movie? <laughs> no, it is this. It is this. Uh, uh, I was going to go to the, the very last shot before we go to the credits is also confusing to me. But anyway, we don't need to. The, the, I don't want to. I guess maybe it's a spoiler. I don't know. But uh, I do think there's no world in which a sequel to this movie isn't better. I mean, yeah, we get in one of the after credit scenes, we get kind of what feels like a setup toward, but I, the setup, it feels like it's setting up a sequel, but to like what, I don't know how the characters we met in this movie would be involved in that in any way. Where, where, what part of the country was that in? Uh, they said Oklahoma, I feel like. Okay. Um, I, and I, I, they, they mentioned the problem is they mentioned a couple places when it came to earthquakes and I couldn't, I couldn't sure if it was like, I know. mentioning a different place or are we mentioning this, where we are? This place. Yeah. And it was the seismic. Yeah. All right. Well, those are our thoughts <laughs> on, uh, Ghostbusters. Uh, and I know I've seen a lot. Of, I posted my opinions. I've seen some people like, well, better than the 2016 one. I am actually not completely sure that that is the case. <laughs> also, is that like how we have to judge all movies? Yeah, good point. Yeah, great, great, great point. Like, it's not like your post said, I liked this a lot better than the 2016. Like, yeah. I don't understand why that's what we have to compare it to. We can't just say whether it was a good or good, not good. Yeah. I, I think if you if you were like, hey, which one of these would you rather uh, uh, rewatch? I was like, well, I, I think I enjoyed, I'd had more fun watching the 2016 one. If nothing else, there's more, uh, there's more ghosts and there's more <laughs> jokes that land. So... <laughs> Yeah. Um, anyway, Roxy, before we go, remind the kids at home where they can find you and what you're up to. Everywhere at Roxy Stryer and be on the lookout. We are dropping our World Girls Calendar Volume 2 very Ooh. soon. Uh, it has some incredibly wild shoots in it. We have a theme for this year that you guys will be able to see. 
Uh, but if you want to know more about that, then you can follow us and watch our show, youtube.com slash the world girls. Please do yourself a favor and go check that out. You can find me everywhere that matters at DJ Talks Trash. You can find the show everywhere that matters at Only Stupid Answers, but on Twitter. You got the values from stupid. Thank you for listening to the show. Please, if you want more content like this, you can go to patreon.com slash only stupid answers, where uh, we also have our Patreon exclusive show, Spiderversity. Go check that out. Uh, and we will see you all next time. Bye, everybody. Bye.